Good morning. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our Hot Topics Bold Thoughts in the New America Lecture Series. My name is Melissa Morris Olson and I serve as Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Bay Path College. This is one of the only events of its kind in the Pioneer Valley and I dare say the region, a free seminar that brings together people from across the many aspects of the nonprofit sector and uh, those who are involved in fundraising and we're so pleased to be able to offer this kind of a forum for professionals here in our region. We've been holding these breakfasts ever since we first launched our graduate programs in nonprofit management and strategic fundraising back in 2006. Doesn't seem possible that we have been uh, running these programs for that length of time. We continue to do this based on the feedback from our attendees. We're so glad for your presence here this morning. You are the brave ones who came through the, uh, our little brief burst of winter weather. And many of you are regular attendees. I see many faces, um, many of you who have come to, I think, just about every one of our Hot Topics breakfasts. And you come back and you bring your friends and your professional colleagues. And for that, we are so, uh, so grateful. We are really fortunate to have Dr. Eugene Temple with us this morning. And you are in for a real treat. He is widely considered um, one of the brightest minds um, uh, truly an international expert in the world of philanthropy and uh, you are in for quite a treat in terms of being able to to hear from him and learn from him this morning. When we held our first Hot Topics in Philanthropy breakfast in 2006, our nonprofit graduate programs were still a dream. They were still on the on the on paper, so to speak. And I'm happy to report that the MS in nonprofit management and the MS in strategic fundraising are thriving. Um, together, they now enroll about 80 students annually. We've graduated over 200 students from the program um, since uh, 2006. And the graduates are doing incredible things, from serving as executive directors of community-based nonprofits to, lead, to leading fundraising programs at major universities, to working within corporate giving offices at national um, corporate corporations. Our students come from across the country and world, and they represent a wide range of positions in fundraising, but also in a variety of management roles within nonprofit organizations. And what our students have in common across all of those um, areas, and I, I would venture to guess that they have this in common with, with those of you in the audience this morning, is a desire to do well by doing good. Our students are very bright, they could do just about anything for a career, and they've chosen to work in a field where they can make a difference, and they are doing just that in spades. Now a program like this would not be possible without the strong leadership of the faculty. We're so fortunate to have Professor Jeff Grime as a founding faculty member and now director of the MS in nonprofit management and strategic fundraising. Yes. Jeff, you have to stand so people know who you are. He's very bashful and modest, but <laughs> Professor Jeff Ryan. I know from our students, and I read a lot of the feedback, the student course evaluations every semester, I know from their feedback that Jeff is a very challenging professor and somebody who has invested himself in the development personally and professionally of our students and the mark he is leaving on our students is highly positive and impactful. Now an event like this would not be possible without the helping hands and support of many, many people, but there's one person I want to call out. Ann Canton, are you? Yes, in the back. Ann is our administrative assistant for the School of Management and Social Justice and she is the glue we all have somebody like this in our organizations. She's the glue who holds all the uh, logistical details together. So please join me in thanking Anne. And I want to also recognize Dr. Sarah Nathan, one of our newest faculty members in the nonprofit and strategic fundraising degree programs. Sarah is a graduate of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, and she is the impetus behind today's program. Sarah, would you please stand?
While at Indiana, Sarah was mentored by Dr. Uh, Dr. Temple, and she is the reason that he is here today. And so she's going to be coming to the podium in just a few moments to introduce him. But before that happens, and because I have the podium, I just have to take a few moments to brag about Baypath. Um, as usual, and if you've been here before, you know this is a very entrepreneurial place. We work at a very fast pace. There's always something happening here, and so not to disappoint you, I do have a few things that I want to update you on. Um, if any of you have driven through the intersection of Shaker and Denslow Road in East Long Meadow, you might have seen the new Bay Path College facility that is being put up on that corner, 56,000 square foot. Um, facility that we broke ground for a couple months ago, planning to occupy it a year from now, and this building will house our burgeoning graduate programs in the health sciences, occupational therapy, physician assistant studies, and more programs to come. So um, we'll be announcing those in the, in the coming years. But we're very excited. East Long Meadow has warmly received us and embraced us, and we're looking forward to um, our new home for those programs um, in, the coming, in the coming year. We're also expanding to downtown Springfield, building on the unique one day a week Saturday program and our online degree completion program for women. We launched last summer the Adult Women's College, also known as TAWC, T-A-W-C, the only program of its kind in the world designed for women. The Adult Women's College has its administrative and its academic offices in downtown Springfield. You may have seen our new advertising campaign. With all the adult women-focused academic programs now under one umbrella, this new initiative broadens the opportunities that are available for adult women by offering more than 20 majors and minors that can be completed entirely online from the convenience of work and home or on ground on Saturdays or a combination of both. The newest major that is being rolled out for our adult women is a Bachelor of Science in Health Services Administration. So if you know anybody looking to complete their degree in that area, um, watch our website for more information. The holiday season uh, has ended uh, with all the bustle and the hustle. But this year, I would imagine more than a few of you probably gulped, as I did, to remember if and when we shopped at Target. <laughs> the data breach at one of the country's biggest retailers brought home this growing new form of crime, cybercrime. In response to this growing threat, Baypath launched this past fall its 13th graduate program, the Master of Science in Cybersecurity Management, under the leadership of Dr. Larry Snyder, one of the few programs in the country that prepares people to manage, respond, and strategize within an organization to protect one of its most valuable resources, data and information. I need to add here, I think every company, business, organization, including nonprofits, are now vulnerable in this regard, and it should be on all of our agendas for the coming year to make sure that we have a cybersecurity plan in place within our organizations, and uh, better yet, uh, to have people who are true experts within our organizations. Um, the MS in cybersecurity management is a wonderful degree. It has a management, strong management focus, and it can be married with our other graduate degrees. And so if you know of anybody, um, for whom that kind of expertise would be important, feel free to pick up information um, in the back. We're also bringing up an undergrad program in cybersecurity, which will be one of, one of the only, uh, one of its kind in the country that will have a partnership with Access Data that will actually allow our students, while they are enrolled, um, to work in virtual laboratories to gain cybersecurity expertise um, and be paid while they're doing it. We just got word that we have received the full approval for our 14th graduate program, the first totally online Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction Writing. One of the most popular growing genres in the publishing industry, our Creative Nonfiction program um, has emphases for those who want to specialize in travel, cooking, spirituality, and memoir writing. And our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences calls this the Eat, Pray, Love MFA degree. <laughs> And I think he's right. So, and for those who aspire to teach creative writing or to publish, the program offers tracks in both of those areas. So, if you have always wanted to find your inner author but haven't found the time, the program will be offered again entirely online and can be 
um, taken in a, a seamless, seamless way. Finally, our 19th annual Women's Leadership Conference is slated for Friday, April 25th at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield. This year's theme resonates with so many of us, I think, personally and professionally, own your story. For nonprofits, big and small, it is often the compelling story, isn't it, from a donor or a recipient that goes to the essence of what we do and why we do it. These stories are moving, they're redeeming, they're inspirational, and they are a true reflection of the collective spirit of our organizations. We're planning a terrific lineup of speakers, as always. And as you may know, if you went last year, we were sold out well ahead of um, the date. So be sure to watch the website and register quickly. Now, as Sarah Nathan comes forward to provide a formal introduction, I want to just express my personal gratitude to Dr. Gene Temple for his presence here. He was also here last night and spent some wonderful time with our alums and uh, professionals from the community. On a personal level, I've been a fan of his for well over 20 years. And I don't know if I mentioned this to you last night. When I was completing my doctoral degree and dissertation at Loyola University of Chicago many, many years ago, I happened upon the research of a young administrator by the name of Gene Temple. And his research informed the model that I eventually developed for my own dissertation, and I will be forever grateful to you for your early inspiration. Since then, he's gone on to inspire countless numbers of men and women across the country. He was the inspiration for the creation of the world's first school devoted to the study and teaching of philanthropy, the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, where he served as founding dean. Jean, we are also grateful to you for your gift of Sarah Nathan. In her short time on our campus, she's having a hugely impactful um, involvement with us, and I'm sure this is no surprise to you. Sarah earned both her master's and her doctorate at uh, Indiana University, and we are the beneficiaries of the excellent preparation she received. Sarah is a gifted and inspiring teacher. Our students have already come to love her, and she's passionate about philanthropy and the role that philanthropy can and does have in creating a healthy and strong civil society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Nathan. Good morning, everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here and to uh, introduce my mentor to you. Uh, but before I do, and since I'm still somewhat new to the Bay Path community, I was wondering if any current student in nonprofit and philanthropy or the strategic fund fundraising uh, program, a current student or an alumni of the program, might just stand so I can see you and you can see each other. Um, it's great to. Good. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here, and um, I, if I haven't already met you, I look forward to, to, being, uh, to interacting with you. Uh, but as Melissa alluded, it is, I feel like I'm coming full circle as an, as an academic person. Jean was hugely influential to, to me in my six years of graduate school. Um, he has had a long and varied career in higher education and the nonprofit sector, uh, from the creation of the Center on Philanthropy at Indiana University, which is now the uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Uh, he has been actively involved in um, Association for Fundraising Professionals, especially with the Ethics Committee. Uh, he ran the Indiana University Foundation, so is a skilled uh, fundraiser in his own right and is also a writer in the field, and I suspect many of you are familiar with the textbook, uh, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, for which Jean is one of the editors. Um, without going into great uh, minutia of Jean's career, he has been recognized for all that he has done 12 times by the Nonprofit Times Power and Influence list for the top 50 individuals in the nonprofit sector, and in 2013 was recognized as the influencer of the year by the Nonprofit Times uh, for his work in the creation of the, the world's first school of philanthropy. But what I really want to emphasize is that Gene is a philanthropist in his own right. Um, in addition to his work building the field, he is passionate about live theater and has uh, been an active volunteer board member uh, 
and most of all, as a teacher and mentor to practitioners and aspiring academics. He really lives the life as a philanthropist uh, and gives his gifts of time and knowledge and wisdom uh, to people like me uh, and practitioners like you who really care so much about the sector and creating a better society. So without further ado, Jean. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to be here at, uh, at Sarah's invitation uh, you know, to, to be part of your program this morning. I, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it, it was wonderful to shake the hand of, uh, of Sarah as she introduced me this morning, as I've done so often when I've been introduced by people and, and, and recognized that this is a person who came uh, to me as a, as a first year uh, graduate assistant uh, in my office uh, six, six years ago. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, Sarah drove me here this morning in the snow, and we had a discussion about that. One of the favorite, one of her favorite stories is uh, about a time when she was driving my car. We were going to South Bend where I was going to address an audience very much like this, I think. And uh, finally, we were into five inches of snow, and I said, Sarah, uh, why don't you pull over and let me drive? And she looked at me and she said, Gene, I grew up in Fargo. <laughs> so that's been one of our favorite, one of our favorites, uh, favorite stories, favorite lines uh, ever since. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to have, I have a PowerPoint pack this morning. I understand that's what we're calling these things today, these days. Uh, and, uh, and, and Sarah actually uh, helped me put PowerPoint packs like this together. So she's going to remember our see our, uh, are, are recognized many of the slides and graphs, and they just have a year or two added on to them now. Uh, and I'm, for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Sarah, I, I should also point out that, you know, that, that book, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, is the third edition is an edition that Sarah helped work on. So we, we gave her credit in the uh, introduction to that book for, for her, her work on that book, and she also co-authored a chapter in that book. So. So she's become part of the living legacy of, of Henry Rosso's work when he wrote the first edition called Achieving an Excellence. And we've now put it in the third edition and we are working on the fourth edition. And the gra my current graduate assistant uh, is gonna get to do some work on, uh, on that. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this morning and share some thoughts with you. I'm looking forward to your, your questions because I like to have a conversation with an audience rather than just uh, speak from the podium, but I do have a PowerPoint pack and I'm going to, I'll give you some, some information that comes from our own work, the, the research work that takes place inside the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and on that we can, uh, we can base some of our uh, questions a, and discussion. Uh, on, on our first slide, I, I just want to talk briefly about the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And I always, we always use cartoons. Sarah has said she has, they've moved some of those cartoons into her own coursework. But here is a cartoon. Uh, you know, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy really prepares people to work in the philanthropic sector as, as, as academics, as, as leaders in the field, in foundations, nonprofit organizations, even to help people become better philanthropists themselves. And, and so the cartoon here is, uh, it's a young man sitting at a, a career counselor's desk, you know, and he's talking about wanting a career, and he says, I'd like to be a philanthropist. They always seem to have plenty of money. <laughs> and um, the, funny, the funny thing about that is that is actually true. Um, because to be a philanthropist, one has to not only have discretionary income available, but has to have a recognition that one has discretionary income available that could be uh, used to help, to help others. And so there's research now that shows that one of, the, one of the triggering factors for a philanthropist is that no matter how much money you have, you have to have discretionary income, but no matter how much you have, you have to have a recognition that you have money or time to share with others. Without the recognition, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't become a philanthropist. So then I, I want to talk just quickly about the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. It's a school that's based on the, the work that we did out of the Center on Philanthropy over a 25 year period, where we built up a, a highly respected research program that still continues today. 
We produced Giving USA. We produced everything in here that I'm going to talk about was produced, was research produced by the, Lil, by the research program in the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. We have a Master of Arts program, which was the first program we offered. It's offered in executive format, where you can come in the summer and complete it. We have a, we have a PhD program in philanthropic studies, which is what Sarah, Sarah completed both the master's and the PhD program in philanthropic studies. We have about, we, we take about six or seven students a year in that. We'll begin taking more now that we're adding more faculty uh, to the program. And, uh, and we have, now we have a Bachelor of Arts degree in philanthropic studies. And philanthropic studies, it starts in the humanities, but it encompasses so much. And I remind all of us that uh, every act of philanthropy is the act of a human being. And that's what a lot of the data here uh, begins to mask. And I always remind my economist friends who do a lot of this work that every data point is an actual human being who acted and behaved out of his or her motivations to be part of that entire data system. Then we have, we have the, the fundraising school, which was a program Hank Russell started in San Francisco in 1984, which is, so it'll be, what, 40 years old this year? 30, is that 40? 30, 30 years old this year, I'm sorry, can't get my numbers right. And, uh, and then we have the Women's Philanthropy Institute, which was started at the University of Wisconsin, actually, uh, by Martha Taylor uh, and Sandra, Sandra Shaw Hardy back in the early 90s. That's now at the Center of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Uh, some of the research I'll cite is research that that institute sponsors. Then we have the Lake Family Institute on Faith and Giving. It's the only known program that looks at the relationship between religion and philanthropy, between faith and giving, and, uh, and, and offers a variety of research programs, scholarship programs, and it's now offering a lot of special programs, especially uh, we're just uh, finishing up a program for women's religious communities. And we, we did the first iteration of that, sponsored by the Hilton Foundation, uh, of, you know, you, of all organizations. The Hilton Foundation is sponsoring that, allowing us to bring women's religious communities together uh, to help them better understand how to organize their fundraising programs. And then we have, uh, we have an emphasis on international programs. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the gist of what we do. Now, I always begin any talk about philanthropy by reminding us what roles philanthropy plays in society. And, you know, because we have a, 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 a spectrum, a broad spectrum of the nonprofit sector re represented in this room, including colleges and universities that fit into this as well, uh, talk just a moment about that. Because empowering us to work in this field to do fundraising work, to have, you know, have co with confidence conversations with people about philanthropy, we have to think about what philanthropy does in society, the roles that it plays. And of course, the first role is it, re it helps reduce human suffering. It, it is help to help make people whole. Human service organizations stretch to the hilt after the Great Recession and still haven't recovered because unemployment is still high, People are still out of work. Their you know, incomes are down even when people are being employed. They're not employed at the same level, et cetera. So human service organizations are stretched to help make people whole uh, during this time. But philanthropy is also about helping, to cre helping uh, people reach full potential, to help every human being become what he or she can be. And so that's an important part of it as well. And that's, that's where colleges and universities come in. That's where art museums come in. And in art museums and colleges and universities try to extend that to everybody, and that's where scholarships come in. So these are, that's how this all fits together. But philanthropy is also about, it's, a, it's about building community, for example. It's about allowing people to come together in common cause to achieve something that they cannot achieve themselves. And people, when they come together with common cause, with out of common values, they find community there. So, you know, uh, Peter Drucker said that the, that's the first job of nonprofits, is to help people be, see what they want to see and to help build community, help them come together with community. Because we sometimes only come together as community around nonprofit causes. 
We don't come together in, 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 in large civil ways. I mean, think of a big city. People get together around common interests and common causes, and nonprofits is a big part of that. It's about equity and justice in society. And here's where we try, nonprofits and philanthropy tries to speak up on behalf of people who can't speak for themselves. It's about uh, creating human fulfillment, and that's the last thing I'm going to talk about today, is the research now actually shows that, that being a philanthropist, being a volunteer, helps you find human fulfillment. It helps every human being become whole. It's about experimentation in society. You know, this, is, this is where society plays with new ways of getting things done, of accomplishing new things, and then hoping that it can spread wider than one organization, take it to scale, if you will. It's about fostering pluralism, allowing each of us to participate the way we want to participate in our society. In fact, uh, we had a discussion yesterday about one of my favorite thoughts about this, and that is, this is, this is in fact the way in which we participate in our democracy. We don't, we, we owe twice as many people um, give and volunteer every year as vote in a, in a given election, even in the best elections. This is the way, in fact, we are, we are fulfilling our democracy, and we have a government that allows us and encourages us to participate in making our society better by acting on our own through private action for the public good. It's an, also the way in which the minority is protected from the tyranny of the majority. It's the way in which we can have alternative structures to, to what, what the majority might want to do with a particular government, city, state, et cetera. So it is, in fact, a very important aspect of what we, who we are as a people. Now let's talk about some numbers here. And we're going to talk about some big numbers, but you know this is a, so this is a women's college that caters to women, so I apologize for the sexist cartoon, but it's wonderful uh, because uh, you know the, car, the the caption says a bake sale may be tried and true, Martha, but we're trying to raise five million dollars here <laughs> and sell a lot of cupcakes to get to five million dollars. So we're going to talk about some of the big numbers. So if you look at the Giving USA, which is produced uh, for the Giving USA Foundation at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. You can see that about $3.16 billion came in total. He told me to turn, not to turn away from the mic, so I have to watch myself. Came in in total in 2012. The 2013 numbers will be out in, in mid-year. It takes about six months to compile these numbers by uh, you know, combing, you know, getting the IRS database back and that kind of thing. But we do have a pretty good estimate for 2012. This is what it looks like. And what, what's surprising to a lot of people is that most of the money is coming from individuals. Now you're going to see that the destination a lot of the mo this money is religion, but that's not, that's not the whole picture. Most of this money comes from individuals. And then if you count in bequests, which, which is for money from individuals who have passed away, and you, you get to a huge part of the total. Corporations give about 6% of the total. They've been hanging in at this number for, you know, for a long time, you know, probably 50 years, 5 to 6% of the total. And then money from foundations in, in, in last year was actually 15% of the total. That's been as high as 20%. But what happened in the 90s with the large run-up in the stock market is the number of new foundations with the encouragement of, of generous tax laws that allowed this to happen and which now have been made permanent so that appreciated assets can go into private foundations at the market value instead of the cost value. Uh, you know, we've got, now we've got about 80,000 private foundations in this country. There were about 20,000 uh, of those in, 19, in, in 18, 1980. So you can see there's a large number, large number of money going in, large amount of money going into foundations. Many of them operated are controlled by families who are still alive. So when you're talking about, you know, major gifts and major gift planning, uh, sometimes you're talking to families who are going to take that money out of, out of their family foundation instead of giving it to you personally because they've already moved assets into family foundations. So that's where the money comes from. Here's where it goes. About the biggest portion of it does go to religion. But the thing is that 
when philanthropy started growing dramatically in the 90s, and it did, just off the charts growth, the, 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 the share going to religion began to decline. So the growth in philanthropy in the 90s really was in areas other than religion. The, the, the percentage going to religion in, in, the, in the mid 80s was about 52 or 53 percent, and now it's down to 33 percent. So religion has grown slightly during this time when everything else is growing dramatically. Education has kind of held its own with the growth. Uh, the ma major growth has come in areas like giving to new foundations, which wasn't even on the charts in the 1980s, and giving to the environment and animals, which wasn't on the charts, it was just included in other, and giving to, uh, giving to, the envir uh, giving to uh, international causes. And a lot of new money is going to international causes. And so you see these things have now made their way onto the charts and those areas found giving to foundations, giving to um, uh, uh, animals and, 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 and the environment and giving to international causes have, have been some of the major growth areas. In fact, if you, we did this one time, if you graph the decline uh, as a percentage of money going to religion uh, for over about a 10 year period in the 90s, and, gra and graph as a percentage of the total money going to new foundations, what you come, the conclusion you come to is that foundations are the new religion. That is, the money that, the percentage share that religion lost was gained by basically by giving to new foundations. But let's take a look at some other things. Now, I like this because you guys would get bored with all these numbers. Uh, here's a cartoon, that it's, it's, it's obviously Christian, so I apologize for that as well, but, but it's really great because he says, guy says, you know, uh, charitable giving isn't the ultimate test of one's humanity, but it does give us some numbers to play with. <laughs> and we always like numbers to play with. We're playing with a lot of numbers here. So let's look at some more numbers. So the, the biggest predictor of growth in philanthropy year to year is the performance of the S&P and the growth in household income. So if you look at, uh, well this isn't, I haven't gotten there yet. This is just the growth of philanthropy over time. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, Sarah, you should remind me. Uh, so what this shows though is that philanthropy is impacted by recessions. And, um, and you can see what happened to philanthropy with the Great Recession in, the, uh, in, in 2008 and 2009. And the tragedy of this is that while the, the current number is coming back, that the, the inflation adjusted amount of money going to philanthropy is not near the, the peaks we had in 2006, 2000, uh, 2005, and 2007. And it's going to take, we predict, about 10 years for that number to come back to where it was. So um, this, is the, this is the tough thing on all of us working in philanthropy. Unless we can increase the share of philanthropy about, from about 2.2% of uh, gross domestic product to say 2.5 or 3%, it's going to be hard to grow philanthropy at a very rapid pace, and especially people working in human service organizations trying to help make people whole during this time are going to continue to be challenged uh, by this slow growth, uh, slow growth, slow real growth in philanthropy. Now let's look at some other numbers. So one of the things that we started doing um, a, a while back was a, a study of high net worth households for Bank of America. And it's really, you know, because we, we, we had this notion that high net worth households are giving differently uh, than, uh, than, the, than the general population and it turned out that, that in fact they were. This is a study of households that have incomes of $200,000 or more and net worth of a million or more outside outside their homes and so that you see see how they how they give now mo more, most of them still give their gifts to religion but when we see some of the other numbers what's happening is they're giving smaller gifts to religion so the gifts that go to religion as the largest gifts um, they are in fact smaller than the gifts that go to higher education and especially the gifts that go to create new foundations so it's, very, it's a very different distribution. But then um, uh, giving vehicles, 23.4 million, I mean 23.4%. Um, education is the largest sec session, section. Religion, religious giving is 12.6% uh, of the total. 
and uh, seventh, and 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 then, and it, go, it goes on, it goes on down. Um, but the key thing is that uh, religion and uh, and education switch for these folks. So when we see some, see see the next chart. I, I don't know, I don't know what what order my slides are in. Well, I like this one because. Um, this one illustrates something that was counter, is counterintuitive. We think that the people who make the largest gifts begin restricting them in ways that you know, go to program support, endowment, certain kinds of endowments, et cetera. And it turns out that if you look at the largest gifts made by these individuals, over half of them go for general operating support. And that was the surprise because most people think that uh, the general operating support comes from the smaller donors and that, the, and that they are actually subsidizing by the general operating support the gifts of the larger donors who make the restricted gifts, restricted to program, endowments, et cetera. Turns out that's not, that's not the case here. Now, I hope that this is what people are experiencing. But then the next thing is to fund a particular, uh, fund a particular program. And we see a lot of switch from you know, making gifts uh, for capital projects into gifts for programs in the last in the last 20 years. So it's been a major shift. Harder to raise money for building buildings, easier to raise money for endowments, especially endowments that support programs for for like in, in, in institutions for faculty or for student support. You know those kinds of things. And so th there, that's the kind of switch that's been taking that's been taking place. So you see capital gifts go, you know, go way down the line here. Uh, they, will they will support the growth of an organization, the expansion of an organization, but general operating support and particular program support, those are the, the two, two biggest areas. In the, in the next slide, I can't remember what order I've got these in now, but uh, we, you know, there, so, so I, 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 this one should be uh, after the next one, but let me just take a moment to ta talk, talk about the issue of, of, of tax, tax, tax breaks for people who make gifts. Now, we all know that, you know, those of us who have been working in fundraising know that there, there, are, there is, in fact, a charitable gift deduction. It goes up to 50%, 50% of your, of your income as an individual if you're putting money into, um, into a, a public charity. It's limited to 30% if you're putting it into a private foundation. But, it, but, it's, um, but, but that charitable gift deduction is under question right now by the House Ways and Means Committee. So we, we asked in this study to, of the high net worth households, we asked the most, the, the most dramatic question. We said, what if the charitable gift deduction were eliminated completely? What would it do to your giving? And about half of the people said it would stay the same, which is, that's the good news part. But the bad news part is that if you look at the other side, about half the people said it would decrease somewhat or it dec would decrease dramatically. So um, th this is the high net worth households, and this is where about 80% of all philanthropy comes from. So again, where philanthropy comes from is skewed. So it doesn't just like, it's not distributed, distributed evenly, across the population. That's why you use gift range charts for annual funds and capital campaigns. You know you have to have a certain number of large gifts. These are the people who make those largest gifts, and this is what they said about the uh, charitable gift deduction. The cost of giving, it turns out, research shows that the cost of giving does, does matter. It doesn't matter as much as you might want it to matter. In fact, some people have fault, found fault with our numbers because they say they're not, they are not dramatic enough. There is uh, a new study that Arthur Brooks has done. He's one of the guys that, pu that publishes research. He runs the American Enterprise Institute now, but he still publishes research. And he's one of the guys that researches out of the panel study that we have running, the panel study on the panel study on income dynamics, we have the philanthropic, uh, uh, the philanthropic panel study. So we, we do giving and volunteering studies connected to that long term that long time panel study it goes back to the 1980s, and um, you can see there that you know that that the cost of giving matters. But but Arthur Brooks has looked at that data since the since the Great Recession, and he says that the impact of the cost of giving is uh, is magnified by the Great Recession, and so that's now that's work we're trying to do because that's work also that the House Ways and Means Committee 
uh, needs to have when they make this decision about how they're going to treat uh, how they're going to treat the charitable gift deduction along with other things that they're that they're considering. Um, so then the next uh, the next slide shows kind of the these high net worth households and how their giving pattern looks compared to the general to the general public. And the biggest and most dramatic thing is that they give more to education than they than they give to uh, than they give to religion. And that's kind of a switch. And in fact, it bears out uh, a, a late 90s study that was done by the Silicon Valley Community Foundation of the donors in the Silicon Valley area. And for them, religion, ha I mean, education had become the new religion. And um, there, there are a lot of ways to, to talk about this. One is that, that uh, the folks who, who, uh, who've made it big, uh, they believe in education because they need a workforce. They, you know, it's where they're getting their talent pool. They also uh, recognize the institutions that helped them get there. Uh, Hewlett and Packard actually met at Stanford. So you know, they recognize and, and, and pay back institutions for that kind of thing. Uh, other folks will say that, in fact, college and universities have the best organized fundraising staffs uh, of any organization in the country. And there may be some truth to that, that they engage people. Uh, and that they, they, they have the staffs, the most sophisticated fundraising staffs of any of the uh, nonprofit organizations uh, there are. Now, and then others will say, well, you've got alumni. But if you look at college and university alumni, the percentage of alumni giving to colleges and universities has been going steadily down for over a decade. And the, the, uh, the total amount of money coming into colleges and universities from alumni is just about 26% of the total. So it's not, where, it's not where colleges and universities find the major part of their money. So about a third of it comes from, uh, from non-alumni individuals, people who care about what the institution is doing, and mostly they're local and can see what the institution is doing for the local community. And the, and the other part comes from foundations and corporations. So uh, that's kind of, it's, it's a different kind of mix, and it takes away the myth that because colleges and universities have alumni, they naturally have uh, this, uh, this base of support that, makes, that gives them a leg up, but it's not, it's not true. The other place where they give a little higher than the general population is in the arts. And, and, so, and that's understandable. I mean, you know, the art, artsies is a kind of a high-end place, right? Um, and a lot of people use that as a social mechanism in a community. The, the theater, the, 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 the symphony, the opera, uh, you know, the museums, you know, those kind of places. Uh, but there are also places that are inspirational and, are, and where we should bring in the entire population. In fact, the Indiana Repertory Theater that Sarah mentioned, where I've been, I'm past, immediate past chair of the Indiana Repertory Theater, and the largest endowment gift received, we've received so far is supporting our children's program we bring about 60,000 kids from across the state of Indiana in to experience the theater. And often to bring those kids in, we have to send gas money out to run the buses from the school corporation down to the theater. So this, this money is going to help support that program. And some of it will go to send gas money out to a, a very uh, an school corporation in an area that doesn't have high income so those kids can get to the theater. And, and I think that's one of the best things that we do. So we also run something called the Million Dollar List. This was started by Art, Art Friends Reb, and he gave it to us in a shoebox full of uh, cards. And now it's a searchable database. We've th thank, uh, thankfully we've had money from the Gates Foundation to help to help improve this, so you can search the, search the data. We now publish reports out of this. Uh, in fact, we just published one for. Uh, uh, for uh, Johnson Grossnickel and Associate, they sponsored a study, and it looks at million-dollar gifts to colleges and universities and some of the other characteristics of colleges and universities that receive those gifts. I can't remember the details, and I don't have them in there. That would have been a good thing to put in here. Uh, but you can find it on our website. We just, we just published that. But if you look at this, it's a, it's a, um, a look at million-dollar gifts that have come in uh, numbers and dollars that have come in over a period of time. And um, you can see that it goes up dramatically when the economy is performing well. The stock market hit a, hit a peak in 2006, and what did million dollar gifts do? 
million dollar gifts went to the top. And so as, as when, when that started, when the, when the stock market started dropping off, you can see that million dollar gifts went down. So some of these million dollar gifts are in fact coming out of foundations and their portfolios went down. Some is coming from individuals and their own stock portfolios went down. There's not the same amount of growth in, uh, in IPOs and then, and then a, blow up in, and a blow up in the stock. So I expect that 2013, this 2013 number is incomplete. So I expect when we get the final quarter in for 2013, we're going to see that number go up a little bit higher than 2012. There should be an uptick in 2012 because the market took a dramatic increase. Unless people have taken a very different attitude now about their giving because of the Great Recession. So there could be, and we'll, we'll see that. We'll see whether people are holding on to their money because, they're, you know, because they see it now as a very temporary kind of thing. In other words, 2006 gave us that great wealth, and then, and then in 2008, it was, you know, half of it was gone. So we, if, if people are thinking that way, it could be that they held on to their money in 2013. We'll just have to see what the numbers look like. Now, on to some other things. Uh, we, we have the Women's Philanthropy Institute, and we look constantly at uh, different ways uh, of, of men and women being different in giving. And since we're at a women's college here, it's, it's a, this is a great thing to be discussing. It turns out that women are actually more philanthropic than men. And, and the short version is that, that uh, single women give more than single men, and, women, and, and, and married households with women give more than, uh, you know, give more if, if, than, 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 than single households headed by men. So single households with two people and a woman Single households headed by a woman give more money than men. So women must socialize people into uh, philanthropy. They must help socialize people into philanthropy. So you see that in each of the diff five different categories we analyze, the female-headed households are more likely to give. They're more likely to give more. Um, every income given, in every income group, women give more than men. So they're a little bit more generous than men are. And this is, this is kind of, um, you know, setting all the kind of uh, uh, preconceived notions about giving on, on, on their edge. I mean, people think of giving as a man's thing, that men made decisions about this. But if they ever did, they don't anymore. And, and uh, this, this should be good news for, 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 especially for a women's college. So um, that's the short and long of that. But we keep doing research out of this. And the last study that we published, I don't know if it's in here or not. What, what, oh, here, we, here it is. The last study we published is, uh, is, is looking at boys and girls. Uh, we have an economist who can go into our panel study and find the behavior of boys and girls. And so um, you look at boys and girls are like equally, about equally, equally likely to give to charity. So they behave about the same. And, and, they're, and they're fairly generous. If you look at boys and girls, kids are in fact giving something to charity. Uh, they report giving something to charity. Now, girls are more likely to volunteer. And you know, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon. Girls are more likely to volunteer than boys are uh, in, the, in this study. Um, most children have parents who are talking to them about giving. That's, that's a really good finding. Because one of the concerns we had in the mid-80s was the whole tradition was going to be lost because there was a decline in volunteerism in the mid-80s. And, uh, it, and uh, this is a good thing that, that, in fact, parents are talking to their children about giving. So we don't just have to depend on Bay, Bay Path College having a, a good, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, campus compact program that puts people in their community. We don't have to worry about uh, all the uh, programs that have in, co in high schools now and in, in, in grade schools talking about giving and volunteering in your communities. Parents are getting involved in this as well. Um, then talking to the children has a greater impact than modeling. So if you look at people who don't talk to their kids but only do, th do this, it, doesn't it turns out that if you don't talk to them about it, they don't do it. So, so demonstrating it or modeling it is not enough. And then uh, talking to children about charity is equally effective regardless of the parent's income level. So it doesn't matter what income level you are. And that's the stories we hear from people who give from lower income households, that they're, they're willing to do for others and they, give, they set an example and talk about the importance of giving to others 
even when they are, they are having to sacrifice themselves. And then talking to children about giving to charity is effective regardless of gender, race, and age. So talking is important, and if you have a message to teach your students and to talk to your alumni about is talk to your children about giving to others. Now, it, uh, it is somewhat generational. If you look at this uh, a study that looks at baby boomers and older generations, um, baby boomers and older generations tend to give and give more than younger than their younger counterparts. Now, there's a, among the millennials there's an in, and the Gen Xers, there's an increase in volunteerism, but do, they do volunteering in a very different way. Most of the research shows that uh, millennials and baby and, and Gen Xers, millennials and Gen Xers do volunteer work as a social activity. So they want to do it together with others. And they don't want to do it on a regular basis. Don't count on them to come in every Saturday morning from 9 to 3 and do a certain thing. But maybe, maybe if you have a big project on a Saturday morning for 10 of them, they'll all 10 show up together and do that, but they won't show up, for, they won't show up next Saturday. And, and, and by the way, you can tell them to come on Thursday afternoon and they'll get it figured out. They'll start texting each other or tweeting or whatever. And, and they'll all show up on Saturday morning. They, in fact, they may send it out and they may have 20 people show up and you only need 10. So that, they behave very differently in terms of the way they volunteer. The concern organizations have is that whether these people will ever grow up and become board members. Because to be a board member, you have to show up on a regular basis and care on a regular basis over a long period of time, right? And that's what, that's what the baby boomers and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the great generation and the silent generation have been doing. And we're going to need baby boomers to take that on next. I mean, the, we're going to need Gen Xers to take that on next. I want to stop with this one. Because this is important work, and we just, we just hired this person, Sarah Conrad from the University of Michigan, who's a social psychologist, and in, you know, I was pleased to hear Sarah's got something going, see, she had an article about this in her class. You can look up Sarah Conrad, you can Google her, you can find her CV. Um, I would tell you, she's 32 years old, but her CV looks like she should be 50. Um, she has, she, her research, Working with, um, working with analyzing data, big databases, and working with, uh, working with the uh, neuroscientists who put those monitors on your brain and can tell where the electricity is going around in your brain, uh, shows that there is, in fact, a positive impact on the donor and volunteer from giving and volunteering. So most of, this, most of the neuroscientists' research show, and, and they're not only at Michigan, but at Oregon and and, uh, and Duke as well, that when people think altruistically, they experience electrical activity in the pleasure area of the brain. So that's, you know, Sarah used the article from the Wall Street's entitled uh, Hardwired for, for Philanthropy. And uh, so it looks like we are in fact human beings that will benefit from this. Now, it translates into other stuff, and this is what's kind of fascinating. Um, it's, it, it's associated with positive health outcomes, including fewer health conditions among older adults. And if you look at, I mean, one, one of the studies we used in this speech, I'm, sh I'm sure Sarah helped me write about, which I was I entitled, Fundraising is Hospitality, because I'm trying to convince a group of Benedictine nuns that doing fundraising is okay, and hospitality is one of their key values. And if you look at the positive impact of, of, of giving on the donor, then you have to think of it as hospitality. It's helping make people whole. And, and, and what many people think about, in, including these Benedictine nuns, is that asking somebody for money has a, a negative, I mean, it, 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 it takes something away from the individual who's giving. The individual is, is, is losing something, is, is, is somehow less, but the person is actually more. I like this, it's, 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 hold it, go back. Can you go back? Um, it, lower blood pressure, lower viral loads, a lower risk of mortality in older adults and chronically ill patients. And the, these important things, this is, think of the health policy implications of this, of this research. We should, this is preventive health care, right, right here. 
and, and I, I know you think it's funny, and you know, I'm not trying to be funny. And you know, if you're doing work in fundraising, you need to be thinking about this. If you're talking to people about philanthropy, you need to remember this, that philanthropy helps make people whole. Um, one, of the, one of the things I found compelling that Sarah put into that speech for the nuns was there was a study of uh, two groups of widows and widowers. And those who, who were active in volunteering and helping others had a much longer life than those who didn't. And you know that's pretty compelling stuff. So these are that's, so there's actually a control group on on, on that one. And then our, our panel study at, that we have um, at the University of Michigan uh, shows the same thing. It you know it show it's showing that those who give and volunteer are healthier. Now you could say well those who are healthier are going to have you know they're going to be able to give and volunteer. But the panel study will actually be able to show directionality. That's the beauty of a panel study. Instead of a group of, uh, instead of successive cross-sectional studies, is that you can show, you can show, you can begin to show causality with enough data collection, and then we'll end with another cartoon. Yeah, it feels good when I, when you volunteer to help others, you know. So like we first know we're picking up on this with Dogbert, and and he says that's why I talked some poor Albo Albonians into mowing our lawn for free. I want them to feel the joy of giving. He says, and then so one of the guys says, all I'm feeling is tired. He says, try doing it faster. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. And there, I know there, there, there'll be microphones floating in the audience here for you to ask your question. And uh, I, we have some people uh, who are watching this through live streaming. And I, I, I know that term now. Um, it's being live streamed. I think that means it's being loaded immediately onto the internet and people can watch it on the internet. And so someone's actually going to take questions from people who are watching it on the internet back here and, 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 and give that, those to us as well. Now, I also have been through this kind of interactive uh, training, um, training training. And uh, I know that it takes seven, se seven seconds for the first question. And so I'm willing to wait seven <laughs> seconds for the first question. Wow, it didn't even take, take seven seconds. One, we have one right here. Thank you, and good morning. Um, I'm interested if you have uh, you know, any kind of thoughts or concerns about uh, some of the recent studies around high net, work, net worth individuals giving to their own philanthropies but then not distributing the money outside of the philanthropy. Have you done any looking into that? Do you have any thoughts about that? Do you mean, uh, do you mean they're giving to their own private foundations? Yeah, and then they're not distributing the money to anyone else. Yeah, well, so they're, they're, uh, they're a couple, you know, first of all, if they, if they put the money into a private foundation, they'll be required to pay out 5%. That's the, the, the that's a, there's a there's federal re IRS regulation around that. Uh, th there there was a concern that people were putting money into donor donor desic donor advised funds in community foundations. Community foundations are public charities, and they're not required to pay out the five percent. So the the money was resting in community found in community foundations and donor advised funds, and, and it wasn't being distributed out. And I think, I said this, and I have to go back and check this, but I think that um, when Grassley was after the nonprofits, when he was ch sent, uh, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, I think he sneaked that into a, a labor law that was being passed. So I think the community foundations now have to distribute an average of 5% from the donor advised funds. But, but that means that if, if somebody distributed 10, that means somebody else didn't have to distribute any. So there was, a, there was a concern about that. So that's just the average of all those funds has to pay out 5%, but I don't think he got the 5% for each fund in. So there is a concern about that. No, this money is supposed to be doing uh, some public good, and if it's just languishing there in the funds, then it's, then it's, then it's not doing any good. So there is a concern about that. Uh, the, the community foundations also have a responsibility to try to, try to push that. So, so they're, you know, they're, they're, this is a tough thing for community foundations. So they've got donor relations on one side, but they've got the needs of community on the other, and they have to talk to donors about it. They don't want to set the donors too much because they really would like to have another $10 million, 
into the donor advised fund, but at the same time they have to help people understand what the community needs. So there, um, th there is a concern about that, but I think that some things have been done about that. By the way, uh, the Tax Act of 1969 put the 5% payout rule in for private foundations because at the time private foundations were doing the same thing. Set up a big private foundation and never pay out any money. But now they have to pay out, uh, they have to pay out 5%. I, I have one from somebody online. Um, this woman says, I am coming from an independent school perspective, and I would be interested to know if there is any specific tools Dr. Temple could recommend to effectively engage millennials in meaningful ways. Well, I, you know, so I, I do think there are ways to engage the millennials. And so um, one, of the, one of the thoughts is if you're, if you're coming from an independent school is to organize activities that you might do in the community where the, uh, the school could be, could foster, say, a volunteer activity in the community, do some good in the community, and bring people together around that? Or is there a project uh, at, the, uh, at the institution where you could bring in millennials to, uh, uh, to do something in an organized way, interacting with, with each other? Um, I, I think colleges and universities have one advantage that other people don't, uh, and that is they can bring people in to meet students, to interact with students. And there's nobody, nobody's ego is damaged when you say, you're a successful alum, will you come in and talk to four or five of our students, have lunch with them and explain to them how you got from your degree here to there? Uh, or, or at an independent school, have somebody come in who's a, who's a student at a, at a university where a lot of students would like to go and have that student come in and sit down at lunch and talk to the students about how, you, how he or she applied to and got accepted at that institution and what it's like at that institution. People will like that kind of thing, but don't ask the millennials uh, you know, to do that over and over again. Say, don't come in here every Saturday morning to meet with students. They won't want to do that. But if you organize something like that, or especially if you get a group of them together uh, you know, to, to do something like that with, with your students, those things might work. Um, I think you have to also engage them using social media. Most, most colleges, universities, uh, most organizations today are using some form of social media to communicate uh, with, their, with their alumni and their constituents. So sending out, sending out tweets. Uh, we have a Facebook page. I don't know how to get there, but apparently we have one. Uh, Julie may be tweeting out uh, about this talk right now. I don't know. Uh, you know but those, those things are going on. And, and the thing about it for most institutions and organizations is they can reach a whole lot more people that way than they could with their traditional methods of communication. And if you, if you tweet something like, about that, like that out or, you, or put it on social media, millennials will be the first to pick it up. Um, and, and you, know, th this is, you know, this is not just something you say, I've got a 29 year old and, um, and he's, he's a neurosurgery resident. And I never get a phone call from him he will not answer an email I send to him. <laughs> uh, but if I text him, he might respond. But I need to follow Facebook because that's how I find out what he's doing. And my wife and I both got our Mother's Day cards and our Father's Day cards on Facebook this year. <laughs> no phone call, no, no card, Facebook. And a whole bunch of people liked it, by the way. Good morning, Dr. Temple. Thanks so much for being here, and thanks to Bay Path for hosting you. I happen to um, represent the Community Foundation here locally, so I felt obliged to stand up and just mention that that law has not yet passed. Okay, thank you. Um, but it is, you know, in conversations, and c certainly Senator Grassley was <coughs> eager to get it passed. It hasn't yet. Um, I did have a question it on. Probably that. won't for a while then, well, because <laughs> gra until Grassley gets right. back in power. That's right. right. We'll see. Um, but I did have a question along those lines around the foundation, uh, foundations is the new religion, you know, the, the movement yeah, right. of giving to, from religion elsewhere. In your data, was, were you including donor advised funds? Yeah, okay. yes. Okay, and is that Do segregated? Donor advised funds and donor designated funds and all the money that goes into community foundations is in that foundation number. Okay, yeah. okay, great. And, can, and, and I should say that. Fidelity and yeah, Vanguard. Yeah, Fidelity's and in yeah. there, everything, yeah. right. Okay. And, and, um, uh, and, and I, I should say that community foundations have been the fastest growing of, of all the foundation areas. I mean, they, 
this huge growth in community foundations, but primarily because they began accepting donor advised and donor designated funds. Right. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the Indianapolis Foundation, which is an old trust form, mm -hmm. had, would only accept unrestricted gifts. And if it was restricted in some way, they tried to give it to somebody else. <laughs> And then they formed around it uh, the Central Indiana Community Foundation, put the Indianapolis Foundation inside it, uh, the old trust, and began accepting donor designated and donor advised funds. And now it's probably got you know six hundred million in assets where it only had a hundred million before. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you um, for being here. Um, I, I run a nonprofit organization, um, the Scribes Institute in um, Hartford, Connecticut, for um, children one through twelve. Um, to increase their literacy and help to reduce the achievement gap. Um, we we um, have success with people giving, but then there are times where uh, people um, have resistance um, to uh, making gifts. Uh, do you have any strategies with regards to overcoming the, the resistance uh, for people that wholeheartedly uh, seem to give, and, as well as foundations and, and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so here, here's the thing about about, here's the thing about giving, it is voluntary. <laughs> and, uh, and some people don't give. There's a certain percentage of the population at all income levels that don't give at all. And people tend to give following their interests. And so it may be that your program is just not a program of interest to a certain individual, because I have other priorities. It, and it may be that foundation you're approaching doesn't have an, in, doesn't have an interest in there. So uh, you have to be more strategic in terms of finding out. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a foundation, they usually publish their guidelines. And so don't send a proposal to a foundation that has guidelines for giving that don't even get close to your area. And that's just irritating to the foundations. Uh, but, but so I think that's part of what you're running into. The, uh, the most compelling thing one can do is tell stories about the success of your organization. And take those stories wherever you can take them. Put them on your website, send them out through emails. Uh, you know, find somebody who will, you know, will run an article in a local paper. Uh, talk, to, uh, talk to the local school corporation about how your program helps them so that people who, you know, people who interact through the local school corporation know about it. I think that's the best thing one can do. And, and, uh, uh, I know I'm going to be asked a question later on, uh, later on when, we, when I have an interview, uh, but I'll just say it here that, that uh, perhaps the most dramatic thing that's happened with the, with the, with the advent of technology it is in fact the internet because it allows us to communicate so much more broadly uh, than, than, we, than, we could, than we could before and, and so much more economically than we could before. So it's, you know, it's just pressing a button and sending out you know, even sending out videos. I, yesterday, my staff sent out a video, um, or maybe it was Wednesday, they sent out a video, um, a, a New Year's message talking about our programs. And it went out to our entire, you know, 80,000 people on, that we have in our database. And, um, and in, they, they shot that video uh, with, uh, with an iPhone. And then they spliced it together, you know, with, it, with homemade technology, I mean, you know, stuff they had on their desk. It cost us nothing to make the video, and we paid exact target, you know, small fee to send those out as individual emails. And, and so it, it's just very inexpensive to communicate that way, and you can reach a broader audience, but tell your, tell, tell your stories. Uh, tell the stories of your success. I think that's the best thing you can do. How do you get to a point, I mean, where do you find the startup money? that you, you know, sometimes volunteers and others have to do this, and then as you try to scale it, you have to try to, you have some history of success that you can take out and, and use to talk to others. I mean, the biggest thing is to be able to demonstrate some success and tell the stories of what you're doing, how you're making a difference. So I always say, philanthropy is, is stimulated by a vision for the future that improves on the present. And if you've got to show how you're gonna make things better, uh, you, you know, for, for these kids in the future. I have another question from online. Um, Dr. Temple, are you obser observing a recognition, a reorganization of board structure in light of the need for Generation X to replace boomers? Hmm. It's a toughie, I think, for, 
uh, for organizations to try to figure out how to bring younger people in. And, and maybe the way to do it is to, um, is to organize activities that allow them to come in as, as social activities first, uh, get to know the organization better. Um, you know, um, at the theater, I can tell you, we've tried everything from having uh, Tuesday night performances where they have a, you know, they have a, um, have a, uh, a kind of bar up in the, in the cabaret theater, you know, before, before the performance begins so they can invite their friends in, giving them half price tickets at the last minute, you know, all those kinds of things. But, but bringing young people in as a way to socialize them. Um, and then it, it may take, for organizations trying to put millennials on boards, it may take, you know, may, may take bringing one or two people together onto a board as opposed to sim simply a, an, a one individual. And that'll be a stretch too because uh, boards will usually think, think about individuals to put onto a board. And it may be that to get millennials, you have to find a person and his or her friend. And the two of them make sure, that, and, and the two of them can serve together. And again, find, do that as a, as a social activity. Um, I, I, I think we're gonna have to keep working at this. I think we're also gonna have to figure out with board work uh, how we can let people participate in board meetings in a meaningful way using technology so that people don't have to come to a place every time, but if, if it's inconvenient, they can simply use you know, you know, uh, technology to, to make this work. And there are, in fact, platforms that allow you to do that pretty easily, just like your live stream. You could live stream a board meeting to somebody, and somebody can, somebody can type a question into a big monitor. Uh, that's, that's right behind you. We, we've actually experimented with that, some of that ourselves. Uh, so I think those, those are some of the ways I think you might do it. Thank you very much for elevating the uh, topic of philanthropy. I, I think we really have a rich history and tradition of philanthropy in the Valley, so thank you. I'm curious with your national perspective, if you, if, um, social entrepreneurship is on your radar screen, and if so, um, what communities are doing it successfully? Well, social entrepreneurship is a, is a, a big deal. And uh, interestingly, social entrepreneurship has, uh, what, what social entrepreneurship means has changed from the time the, 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 it was first, start, start, first used to what it, what it is today. When it was first used, Social entrepreneurship meant that it was a, of a nonprofit organization acting very entrepreneurially, and uh, and so they were applying the the principles of entrepreneurship to nonprofit management essentially, and helping the the nonprofit look around and find ways to grow and develop, expand its markets, you know, scale up, you know, those kinds of things. And in fact, if you weren't scaling up, you just weren't you just weren't making it. And uh, th th then there were, then this thing started happening where people formed for-profit businesses where the, where the money went back into philanthropy. And that was a form of social entrepreneurship. Um, so, so that, um, and, and, and many of those still exist and, and exist successfully where people are earning money with one kind of activity and then putting that back in, putting the, all the profits back into philanthropy, like granola, like, you know, like, like Paul Newman, uh, you know, and so you can go on and on. There's a company, I've forgotten the name of the company, it has a, um, it has a plant in Africa, and, and it, it's a, far, it, it, you know, and all the profits from that plant go to provide product from that plant back to people who can't afford it in, in, that, in that nation. But today, there's a whole other discussion of, of social entrepreneurship, and that is um, uh, running a business as a for-profit, with a lower profit margin, to provide social good. And, and now, that, now there are people in the White House, especially, who are interested in government policies that can help build in that direction. Uh, you can, you know, so that you, make, you invest money in a, a good social cause, and if you are able to achieve big results, the government might pay that nonprofit, and you get your money back. So it's a whole uh, it's a whole new ball game. Uh, we're working with a we're working with a group out of Idaho right now, because they have a fairly good sized database that looks to grow, and they have real time data on non small nonprofits uh, financial statements, 
And so they're, they're we're talking to us about whether we could use that aggregate data, not the individual uh, organizations, but the aggregate data you know, to, to analyze the, the health of nonprofit organizations. They, those guys call themselves social entrepreneurs. They've got, they've got angel investors. They, they're, you know, they're, gonna, they're a startup. They want to make it big. They have to pay back the angel investors. All of the guys think of themselves as entrepreneurs in the for-profit sector, but they're providing a service at a lower cost than a nonprofit can provide by him or her, by itself, by hiring a financial, a chief financial officer. They don't need a full-time chief financial officer at a high salary. These guys can do it, they think, for about a fourth the price. And, they, and they are, they're real-time online. They're in Idaho because in Idaho, rents are lower than they are in other places. They, the labor costs are lower. They like, they like living in Sun Valley, and you know, they're, there they are. And they're operating this thing across the country, all online. They have people who live, maybe somebody lives right here and works for them. You know, it doesn't matter where you are when you're online. They're, they consider themselves social entrepreneurs. And so there's a whole, it's a, it's a whole gamut of activity. And that's, but that's one form of social entrepreneurship. Is anyone looking at it nationally to your knowledge? And are there any communities that have been recognized for their leadership in no, that? Uh, I, I, I don't know that anyone's, anybody's been recognized for their activity, but it started in Silicon Valley. And that's, I mean, that's where it first took root. And by the way, Gregory Dees, I just learned yesterday that Gregory Dees died. He's the guy who was at the Stanford School of Business. And he, he's the guy that kind of created this concept of social entrepreneurship. And, and, and they started the Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Stanford. And the White House office is not called social entrepreneurship. It's called social enterprise. That's the name of the White House office that used to be the Office of Volunteerism and Philanthropy or something like that under Clinton, and now it's called, I think, the Office of Social, Social Enterprise. They think that you should move away from nonprofits into a more profit-like format to achieve some good. So this is, and these guys are millennials, and you know, they're, they're uh, and Gen Xers, and they're, you know, they're, they think differently about this than, 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 than we might, you know. I always buy, one of my mentors is a guy named Howard Schaller, and he had, he had a number of wonderful uh, sayings, but one of them was this. He said, he said, retirement is a race between your age and obsolescence, and you hope you get there first. <laughs> and some days I feel that way. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you for being here. I've been doing fundraising for 20 years or so. I currently work at an international nonprofit. Um, I've done my time in hospital and education as well. And in Following the work of the center, uh, the question that I've always, you know, gone back and forth about is the difference between transformational philanthropy, which is what you started off your talk with in a wonderful way, and what I've been experiencing more in the latter part of my career in terms of really what's becoming more transactional. And it's, for me, a good follow-on to this question because what I'm experiencing, certainly in the international space, is that uh, in organizations, they're looking at fundraising teams as revenue producers. And I come to it from a transformational place of working, giving funders the opportunity to participate in a transformational activity and change. But then also philanthropists are coming at it more from, what am I buying? How can you help us respond to this environment in both organizations and with our philanthropists? Yeah, I think, uh, by the way, you didn't, you didn't do your time there. I mean, you, had a, you, you were able to serve and really accomplish great things. So don't say, I, I did my time. Uh, that sounds like being in prison. You weren't in prison. <laughs> you were achieving transformational gifts. Um, the, the, um, we, we brought some of this on ourselves. Uh, you know, I, I, I go to places and I hear fu fundraising people talk about, well, we don't, we don't do, we don't seek gifts, so we're not looking for philanthropy. We're, 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 we have people making investments. So they started using the language of, of, of the stock market, uh, you know, to, uh, in, in their philanthropy work. So, so we created some expectations of what are people going to get back. 
And, um, and we, so we moved away from that. Now, I think that um, um, you know, when we talk about transformational gifts, we, we, we forget sometimes that the transformation is also on the other side. So, so that people's lives are transformed when they make these big gifts. One, one of the most wonderful things I heard from a woman who gave us $5 million, and we put her on this advisory board for the program that, she, that was set up. Uh, it's the Lake Family Institute on Faith and Giving. She said, this gift has transformed my life. That's what we have to remember. It's not that the Lake Institute has now transformed the way we think about, about giving and, and, and spirituality and all those things, which it has. That was a transformational gift on the institution. But she said, this gift has transformed my life. And what concerns me about the social media giving and the crowd giving and all that is that that is, in fact, transactional. You know, we just, we just make a gift. If we send a gift over the internet, we just make a gift. I, that's how I send my Red Cross gifts. They, send, they, they, they make an appeal when there's a disaster, and we send some money. And then, of course, they send us more appeals when more disasters happen because they know we'll respond, right? But that's, that's just transactional for us. But uh, the gifts we make to the theater, the gifts that we've made and the scholarships we've set up in the university, those things are transformational. They not only make a big difference in the university, but they change us. We don't get changed by the money we send to the Red Cross. We don't get changed by the crowdfunding doesn't change people. It might, light, it might make them feel good because they're participating together in something. So my concern is that we don't have an opportunity to talk to people and explore with them how making a big gift could transform their lives. And, um, and, and I, I, I regret that, the, uh, that an organization looks at its fundraising staff as just money producers. Because uh, what they should, fundraising from my perspective is the, is the difficult work of engagement. It's, it's figuring out how you engage people. And millennials get engaged differently than others. Everybody has their own way of getting engaged. But fundraising is about engaging. And if, if, the, if the organization is just looking at fundraising as producing money, it's never thinking about the stewardship back, communication back, the involvement of those people in the, or, in the organization in some meaningful way. And I think that's the part that, that's missing. And that's, that's, that's talking to the organization to try to, make, to try to make that happen. And then using some people from outside to help advise you on how to draw, how to draw people in. Um, because fundraisers are not just money producers. They're, they're people who are, they're at the edge of the organization trying to engage the public in the institution, trying to engage donors in the institution in a meaningful way where they'll pick up on what's being done, really find some way to transform the organization and their own lives by doing something major. And if you, if you never get past the lower level transaction stuff, and even if the big stuff just becomes transactional, I'll give you a million dollars, but I wanna know what, you know, no. No, you know, tell me more about the million dollars. I had a guy tell me once he was giving away ten million dollars a year, and I said, "Do you? How do you feel about that? Do you ever feel any satisfaction from the ten million? He said, "No, none at all." I said, "Why are you doing it?" He said, "Because my tax accountant told me that's what I should give away." I said, "You need some help. You need, some, you need to start in a different place." And I sent him the philanthropic autobiography. I said, "Start there. Think about philanthropy from." from a different perspective. And I think that's often what happens. And, and when, somebody's, you know, when somebody uses, like if one of you says, well, we're, we don't do philanthropy, we just take investments, I would give you a lecture. And so I try to correct that kind of language, but it's, it's pretty pervasive right now. There's a lot of people talking about it, and I think, I think it's because they're embarrassed to think of themselves as fundraisers, and they're embarrassed to think about philanthropy as a meaningful activity that takes place in people's lives. And they think about philanthropy as diminishing the, diminishing the giver. They think about volunteer time as diminishing the volunteer. When in fact, volunteer activity and giving both enhance the individual who gives the volunteer. Hi, um, I just had a question about the statistics that you showed about uh, the trends in giving over the last, say, decade or so that was up there. Is it too early to determine if there are any clear trends since the market meltdown in 2008 as to which specific areas of uh, philanthropy are getting or restoring some momentum in giving. 
uh, is it too soon to draw any conclusions from that, or is anything uh, 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 you know, apparent? Um, the only thing that one can see is that uh, human, human services did, did tick up slightly. And there, 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 there haven't been um, any major changes in, in distributions except that, um, except that you know, over, over a decade, um, you have an increase in giving to foundations, increase in giving to environment and, and animals, and, and increase in, in international giving. And then everything kind of everything else kind of held on held its own. But when 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 Hurricane um, <coughs> Hurricane Katrina hit, the, the largest outpouring of support ever in mankind went to support Hurricane Katrina, larger than 9/11, larger than tsunami. Uh, the, the, the you could it was so large that you could notice it in the Giving USA total. So Giving to Human Services just shot up. Because all of that money went to the United Way, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, you know, the kind of human service organizations. In, when the recession hit, you saw an uptick in giving to, uh, give, giving to human service organizations. The problem with giving to human ser service organizations is it doesn't last. As soon as the kind of uh, uh, crisis uh, disappears from people's minds, it goes back to, it, the distribution goes back to kind of where it was before, before the crisis. In, in, and I, I haven't seen that, um, it's, that there's been an uptick that's outperforming everything else since the recession. One other question. Um, it, are you seeing any kind of trend in giving to traditional arts, such as symphonies, museums, as opposed to maybe more new political, um, you know, avant-garde kinds of things? What, what do you see for the um, established arts? Yeah, well, um, you know the uh, the established arts in our community uh, have been holding have been holding up pretty well. Symphonies across the country are in trouble, as you know. Um, their their fundraising is down. Uh, their their attendance is down, and so the somehow the symphony has fallen out of favor. Um, the the giving to the new kind of avant garde happens with avant garde and and uh, nouveau rich and you know people who get interested in those things and they're it's sporadic and, and, and spotty but i don't know if there's been any any major change in the uh, in, in, in trends with those organizations except for the symphonies are struggling right now many of the symphonies are just having a difficult time and of course the opera always has i mean you just have to kind of find a few special people who want to support the opera they always have a, a, a difficult time but i think the museum most of the major museums are having you know, having uh, you know having a fairly stable uh, situation, and and I, I'm 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 grateful that the I, the Indiana Repertory Theater was able to increase its giving every year during the downturn. The only problem we had was we lost our subscribers, and uh, you know, and and really uh, we're operating on a razor on a razor thin margin right now, because we lost our subscribers after we had the season locked in, and 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 just went it was just huge. It's a huge hit the first year. But that's the problem, and the fundraising kept going up. In fact, one year we had the largest amount of corporate support ever from, for the IRT. So in that perspective, people, people rallied around that, but the subscribers were gone. And I think that's part of what's happened to symphonies, their subscribers are gone. And, and, the, and one of the problems is that when, when you lose patrons, you lose donors, because about 90% of the donors come from the subscriber base at the IRT. And that's the same thing for symphonies. Um, so I think that's, that's the big struggle there. Thank you everyone for your questions. I think we're going to wrap up there okay. and thank you, Gene, for being here. Uh, some of us will be milling around afterwards. So if you still have a you know, pressing question, you're welcome to come and visit us uh, after the formal program. But uh, thanks again for being here and Gene uh, for spending a couple of days here with us. And we have a small gift for you here under the podium. There are actually three. Um, we talk a lot about bold women here with our traditional undergraduate students, and there are three young women in Jean's life uh, who we hope to gr that they grow up to be bold women in their own right. And so we have three Bay Path t-shirts for your three bold granddaughters. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.